for tonight's uh, live Q&A, uh, do's, don'ts, and how-tos, the law school application process. Uh, we're really excited about the content we have to share today. Uh, we're hosting this uh, along with the University of North Carolina's law school uh, down in beautiful Raleigh, Durham. So uh, this is such a, a unique opportunity for you all to benefit from the knowledge of uh, some law school professionals who can help you get this process figured out. So uh, my name is Justin Williams. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions and Diversity Recruitment uh, here at Wayne State University Law School. Uh, this is uh, my third official cycle doing law school admissions. Uh, and I've seen enough applications to know that I am in the right place uh, and I'm able to uh, impart some wonderful and important knowledge to you all. I'm also a graduate of Michigan State University College of Law. Uh, in beautiful East Lansing, Michigan. So uh, I know enough about law school at this point to be dangerous. So I'm hoping that our conversation today can help you all get a better understanding of what the law school application process looks like uh, and how you can really build some advantages in for yourself in the application process. Uh, I am joined by the wonderful, effervescent, and brilliant Michelle Gunter. Uh, I will allow her uh, to introduce herself properly because I can't give do her enough justice. So, uh, Michelle, introduce yourself to the room today. That was a great introduction. I think I'm fine there. But I am Michelle Gunter. I'm the Director of Admissions and Recruitment Management at the University of North Carolina School of Law. Um, this is my fourth recruitment cycle. Um, so as Justin said, I've definitely had some time to look over applications and hopefully to be able to give you all some great tips and guidance on going through this process. I'm a graduate of Texas A&M University School of Law in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and like I said, I've been working in law school admissions. So Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It is certainly our pleasure. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get right into the meat of the presentation today. Uh, so there are our lovely faces. We just handled uh, the introduction piece. So I think it might be a good idea to start by pulling the scope out, right? Looking at this from a 50,000 foot view and talking broadly about uh, maybe what law schools are looking for generally, right? Uh, in the law school application process. And I think it sort of boils down to three really big questions. And Michelle, if I'm wrong about this, please feel free to chime in. Uh, I think the first question that we're trying to get answered is uh, admissions professionals is can you do the work, right? Do you bring to the table the kind of academic ability and track record of performance uh, that would give us as admissions professionals confidence uh, that you could step into our institution with the kinds of students that we admit the rigor of our program and the expectations we have of our students and compete immediately, right? Uh, and the path to answering those questions is uh, well-trodden, right? Uh, well-worn path. And we're typically looking at uh, two indicators primarily with some credence given to a third, right? Uh, and I think that starts with your performance on the LSAT uh, and some institutions look at other uh, standardized tests like the GRE, but broadly speaking, if you want the, the largest suite of options, uh, the LSAT's the test uh, that law schools will use to help uh, explore that academic ability piece. And then also your GPA, uh, but more importantly, or I guess in support of that, what that GPA tells us about who you are as a student, right? Are there trends right. in your performance, uh, things that have happened to you academically that sort of give us an idea of who you are as a student, the rigor of the institution you chose, the program that you're in, the kinds of courses you've taken, how you've performed in those, right, are some of the factors that we're looking at to help us understand what that GPA actually means. Uh, another piece that can be sort of informative, right, but not dispositive of academic ability are letters of recommendation from people who've taught you in a classroom. Uh, I truly urge students who are recent grads, right, to mm -hmm. prioritize uh, uh, recommenders who are people who taught you in a classroom recently. I uh, just had somebody ask me uh, yesterday, actually, uh, would a high school teacher work? <laughs> and it's like, well, uh, not necessarily, right? right. That's right. Uh, that that ship has sailed, right? And so mm -hmm. it's a, a much more pertinent letter if it's coming from somebody who's taught you while you were in undergrad, has an idea of who you are in a, in a classroom, how you show up, how you approach uh, sort of the work of being a student, 
uh, and providing some reference there. And I think the second question that law schools are trying to answer is really uh, uh, what's the value add, right? So what's the, who are you beyond that academic ability and performance? What will you bring to our classroom, to our institution, to the profession uh, beyond what you can do in, uh, in your head? So I think that comes out in terms of your personality, what you've accomplished, your character, and really your fit for that individual law school. And I think we get to that uh, through some of the things that you all already know about, right? So your personal statement can be a key cog uh, in us answering that question. Your resume is a huge piece of that conversation too. Uh, to a uh, informative extent, again, letters of recommendation can come into play here. So uh, if you've got faculty who are recommending, they can probably tell us something about who you are as a person because they've had you uh, in the classroom and you've contributed and been involved uh, in their class in some ways that are important. But if you've got recommenders who aren't faculty, right? So if you've got supervisors or professional references or personal references who want to vouch for your candidacy, they're probably going to touch on some of those things about your personality, your character, what you've accomplished in your, in your fitness for practice uh, that would be informative as it relates to that question. Uh, there's also addenda that you can submit, right, as a part of this process. We'll talk about those a little later, so I don't want to spend too much time uh, addressing them here, uh, but those are another piece that we can use to inform that second question. Uh, the third piece, which is something you all really don't get a vote in, right, is how you measure up against the larger applicant pool, how you measure up and sort of align with our institutional enrollment goals. It's a tapestry that we weave every year, right, in terms of a law school admissions process. And we're trying to build the strongest, most qualified class that we can. And so we're measuring you as it relates to your fitness in terms of uh, those enrollment goals and what we hope to achieve. And also taking a look at how you compare to that uh, applicant pool sort of narrowly, right, in terms of our institution, regionally, statewide, nationally, how do you compete? How do you fit into that picture? So I think that's sort of a pulling the scope back piece. I don't know, Michelle, if you've got any thoughts about that part. No, you're right on track. That's exactly what I tell folks when I'm looking at applications. That's how I look at things. Um, and I encourage applicants to think of it as a big puzzle. Mm -hmm. And law school and the student, we, those are the first two pieces of this puzzle um, that have to fit together. And so that's what we're trying to make sure that all the little cogs and wheels are right in the right place. Absolutely. All right, so uh, the law school admissions test or LSAT. Uh, some of you are probably preparing to take it on Monday. Uh, good luck to you. Uh, get some rest on Sunday night. Try not to take a diagnostic the night before. Uh, but we'll talk about the test sort of broadly here for those who may not be as familiar with the exam. Uh, so to register for it, lsac.org is the place to go. Uh, if you are in this conversation, if you're here uh, today and you don't know what LSAC is, I would encourage you to check it out because it's going to be a central cog uh, to your law school experience. The, the application process happens there. They administer the LSAT. There's a boatload of resources available through LSAC that you can access to help you understand the law school application process, whether or not law school is the right fit for you, the LSAT itself, anything you can think about as it relates to law school, they touch on in some way in terms of resources that they offer. So uh, they would be the place that you go to register for the LSAT. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the entire test is digital now. Uh, there was a time uh, when it was a paper and pencil test. It feels like a lifetime ago, but it was really just a half a year ago. If you had done this earlier this year, you could have still taken the uh, written exam, but the entire exam is done digitally on these handy tablets. Uh, that bring some efficiencies to the process, uh, but they also pose some challenges. So just be conscious of that as you're going through this process. Uh, the writing section itself, which used to be a part of the exam, uh, is now separate and done from home. So be conscious of that as well. Uh, if you want to learn more about the, the writing component, uh, there's a link there. L LSAC does a good job of explaining what your options are and how you can approach that process and what the expectations are around that. Uh, so you won't do it at the same time you do the exam, you'll do it separately. Uh, and then uh, I guess maybe sort of a table setting piece, at least in terms of understanding how law schools will 
uh, or why law schools use right the Yale status consistently as they do, uh, because there is a certain level of reliability or at least consistency in terms of what law schools see uh, in first year outcomes by looking at the LSAT score and the undergraduate performance. So there's some uh, practical magic that happens behind the scenes that uh, LSAC uses to give us a number that helps us understand sort of maybe where you might fall, right, uh, in your first year based on uh, the uh, your LSAT score and your undergrad performance. And so that's why that's one of the factors uh, that continues to be used in the uh, law school application process. Uh, so the test itself, five 35 minute sections of multiple choice questions. One of them is going to be reading comp. One is going to be logical reasoning to analytical reasoning. And then there'll be a section that's, uh, there'll be a section that you don't know, right? That won't be used and calculated into the score. So that's typically what you'll get in terms of the LSAT itself. Uh, scores range from 120 to 180. Uh, and then there's your, of, of course, your writing sample, which will be included as well. All right, so digital, right? That seems like a curveball. Uh, if you want to find out more about the digital LSAT, how it looks, what the interface looks like, uh, try to get a, a digital practice test done, right? Because I think you should do that. Uh, you can find more about the exam itself at familiar.lsac.org. Uh, and then there's also a link that gives you a little bit more info about taking that digital test if you have questions. Uh, you see the link there with several backslashes that I won't bore you with. All right, so uh, I'm going to cede the floor to Michelle. I know she's got some really good thoughts about uh, preparation and some ideas that you all can use. Uh, so I'll cede the floor to her to talk a little bit more about uh, LSAT prep. Awesome. Um, so the biggest thing is to actually do it, right? The LSAT is, like we've talked about, a big part of the application. It's one of the first things that we see. It's something that we can compare um, across the board. When we're talking about GPA and things like that, some schools weight their GPAs differently, that some schools are more rigorous than others. And so um, we can't always necessarily care, compare apples to apples as easily. Um, but when we're talking about the LSAT, everyone is getting the same LSAT. Everyone has the same administrations um, and things of that nature. So this is the one place where I can absolutely compare you to those others in the applicant pool. So that's why it's so important to make sure that you're studying and preparing. And so some of the things to think about is how do you study? How do you take tests, right? If you're someone who um, has issues with anxiety when it comes to test taking, what do you need to do in order to put yourself in the best situation so that you can give the best performance possible when it comes to test day? Um, one of the biggest mistakes I see with students when they're preparing for the LSAT is that they are studying um, in the peace and quiet of their own home, which is a really great thing to do, but the reality of it is, is when you're taking the exam, you're in a classroom, you're in a, a hotel banquet room, whatever the case may be, you're in this large space with 30 to 50 more other people, if not more, and people are sniffling, they're sneezing, they're coughing, they're moving around, monitors um, and the, the test administrators are walking around the room, and there's a lot of other distractions. And if you aren't prepared for those distractions, then that could be something that slowly takes time away because you're having to refocus every time you're looking back at your exam. Um, so kind of think about what do I need to do? How can I prepare myself for a test setting? If you're at an undergraduate institution, see if any of your pre-law advisors are going to be able to offer um, a mock exam that you can at least get some idea of what it feels like to be in a testing room. Make sure that you're practicing under time conditions. Um, absolutely. At some point, you are going to take your time. You're going to say, okay, this is, these are the steps I need to follow in order to approach this question, right? We have to understand the process. But once you understand the process, then you have to make sure that you're doing it under the time limit. I can do a logic game all day if you give me enough time. Um, but when you put yourself under that time constraint, it definitely changes how you approach it. And remember, when we're talking about the LSAT, you get a point for everything you get right. You don't lose points for things that you get wrong. Um, and so staying on a question for a really long time, if you don't know the answer, sometimes it's better for you to just give your best guess and move on to the next thing because there might be other questions later on that you can answer faster um, and be able to gain more points that way. Um, and then when you're thinking about like, how do I do this, right? Um, there are a lot of different tests prep materials that are out there. Some of them are more expensive than others. The truth be told is that all of them are going to be good for the right people, 
right? Um, so you have to figure out what, how do I learn? What do I need access to? Do I need to be in person? Can I be just online? Um, what do I need in order for me to learn all of the things that I need to learn? Do I need to have unlimited access to questions or do I just need the set? Do I just need to figure out exactly what this is? Um, and using that information is gonna help you to narrow different things down. Like I said, get in contact if you are on a campus, get in contact with a pre-law advisor to find out if there are any discounts or codes or partnerships with any of these test prep companies that can give and relieve some of that burden for you. Um, and then, of course, we want to make sure that we're highlighting Khan Academy because it is absolutely free. Um, and I've heard um, some folks absolutely love it. Some people didn't really care for it. But again, it's talking about how you learn. Um, but I think the biggest thing of it is that it's free. Khan Academy is made with a partnership with LSAC, and those are the folks who are writing the LSAT, right? Um, and so they, the hope is that they have a little bit of inside knowledge. Um, but also with that, the fact that it's free, there's some di diagnostic tests and things there. So even if you decide not to use it, ultimately, I think it's a great resource and a great tool for people who are getting started to get some exposure to the exam and figuring out what do I need to do? What areas of this exam do I need to really work and build myself on? Um, and then also prepare to be able to take it more than once. Um, a majority of law schools now accept your highest LSAT score. I don't know if there's a law school now that still averages, but the majority of your law schools are going to accept your highest LSAT score. And so um, I always encourage applicants to think about when do I want to apply? Um, and then when do I need to take the LSAT that I have enough room that if I want to take it again, if I want to increase my score, because increasing my score can increase my chances for admissions for some law schools can increase my chances for scholarship or increase my scholarship amount, putting yourself in the best position to be able to do that. So when you're thinking about preparing for the LSAT, give yourself enough time to study. Think about when you're studying, how you're studying, um, making sure that you're putting yourself under time pressured conditions, giving yourself as much as a test e um, exam day experience and before you get into the exam um, and then preparing to take it more than once if that's something that you may need depending on what your score is. Absolutely, all great advice, thank you. All right, so let's talk about building an actual law school application. So what's in it, right? What are the what are the pieces? What's the timeline? What should you be thinking about? Uh, so this is, uh, we'll take a big picture look at this. So the, the online application process itself happens via LSAT. So uh, I've gotten more questions recently about people who are interested in submitting applications directly to the law school. Uh, mm -hmm. It does not work that way. Uh, LSAC is the clearinghouse. They maintain all of the information. They provide us with that JD Credential Assembly Service Report that you see down there at the bottom, uh, and they help us regulate the process, right? They give us a sort of a consistent approach to it. Uh, so you do have to do it online through them. Uh, do not submit an application directly to Michelle or me because we can't do anything with it. Uh, so. Uh, the materials in it, beyond the actual physical application that you'll fill out, uh, you'll need a personal statement, uh, a resume, letters of recommendation, any addenda if they apply to you, uh, and then that credential assembly service report, uh, which will include your LSAT score or scores uh, and all of your undergraduate uh, transcripts and your GPA, right? Uh, it'll be every, every school that you've gone to post high school uh, the transcripts will need to be requested, uh, and then they'll be compiled in that Credential Assembly Service Report, which will go to the schools uh, to help us understand what your academic career looked like. Uh, applications typically open in the fall, the calendar year before you plan to enter. For example, for those of you who are considering fall 2020, uh, the applications are open now, right, uh, for you to be able to take that step and that journey. Uh, most places have a rolling admissions process. So as the applications are received, they're being reviewed and decisions are being made and offers uh, are going out as well. So uh, what that means is that the later you apply in a cycle, right, uh, the more challenging it could be for an offer of admission to be made to you, depending on your qualifications and the overall strength uh, of your academic profile. Uh, so the big picture point here is to make sure you plan ahead, right? Uh, if you are choosing to uh, embark on this journey, uh, you should be thoughtful about every phase of the process. Uh, the stakes are extremely high, right, in the law school admissions process, and so are 
uh, some of the associated costs, right? Uh, and so you want to make sure that you've got your ducks in a row uh, if this is the journey that you plan to take because timing matters. Uh, I encourage every student to think about how they might fit into a school's academic profile, right? As you're building out the list of places that you're choosing to apply to, you should have an idea of where you fit based on your performance on the LSAT and your GPA and that school's typical sort of applicant pool and, and who they would typically admit. Uh, LSAC has a resource that you can use. Uh, it's not foolproof, right? And it doesn't guarantee you uh, admission to a place based on those numbers, but if you put in your LSAT score and your undergraduate GPA, they can give you an idea of the schools that you might be a good fit for, right? That you should at least consider applying to because you might fit uh, with, with their academic profile. So uh, make sure you're planning ahead and not waiting until the last minute because the best opportunities uh, do go to those who uh, take those bold steps and are being thoughtful about the process. Any other thoughts on the, the application elements and timeline, Michelle? No, I would just like to mention when you're talking about um, entering your LSAT score, for those who are like, I haven't taken the LSAT yet, I don't know how I did. If you have a practice score, enter your practice score, yeah. and then do it again, entering your practice score minus about five points. Mm -hmm. Because on average, um, where people, their actual LSAT score compared to their practice score is usually in a three to five point range differential. Mm -hmm. So um, just kind of keep that in mind so you're not uh, shocked or caught off guard if you're not scoring exactly where you were in your practice exams. That is pretty usual. That's pretty consistent um, for what we're seeing for applicants. And so that can also give you an idea of if you're exactly where you're supposed to be. And also if you don't perform where you've been performing on your practice exams, it also give you a good range of other law schools that might be available to you. Absolutely. That is great advice. All right. So let's talk about that big question. The first big question, which we're really focusing on academic ability and performance. Uh, Michelle, what, what are some thoughts you have for uh, our listeners today about this this first big question. Yeah, um, like we are, like I said before, making sure that you're giving me the best you, right? So for those who've already graduated, your GPA is your GPA, mm -hmm. um, and those who are in your senior year, depending on where you are and what kind of classes and credits you have left, your GPA may kind of still be your GPA. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where the LSAT is going to be important. And so preparing and giving quality LSAT scores is going to make you a more competitive applicant for different law schools. Um, for those who are still early in this process and still have a fighting chance to increase and to continue to improve your GPA, that's really important. Um, when we're looking at applications, we're looking at trends, right? We want to see if you are, I always say there's a lot of different ways to get a 3.0 GPA, right? Um, you could be a solid student across the board. 3.0 was just where you were every year, every semester. You could be a student who maybe had a rough year, a rough semester, um, and that happens. I hear that um, often. That was my story at one point in undergraduate um, that I always tell people sophomore year, I don't know what I was doing, but undergraduate was not it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that was reflective in my GPA. Um, but if you look at the rest of my years, everything is great. Uh, and so I use an addendum to be able to talk about that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but that I pay attention to that. Right. And that student I'm not as concerned about because that means there was just one time that kind of knocked them off their feet. And depending on how they explain and talk about it, it depends on how well um, I can trust that they're going to continue to be an excellent student in law school. Because remember, we're using all of this information to try to give the best prediction to how you're going to be in our law schools. Right. And, and then there's the heartbeat student. Um, and that's the student who maybe starts off low and then goes high and comes back low and goes high. And they all the three of these students have a 3.0, but they all got them very different ways. Mm -hmm. And some I would trust a little bit more than necessarily the others. So making sure that you're being consistent in your grades, that you're increasing your GPA is going to be really important. Mm -hmm. um, for those who are in or did dual degree programs, um, who did like early college programs and things like that, or for those who are in them right now and considering law school, make sure you keep your grades up. Um, going to community college, um, when you go back home for the summer, you're just going to take a class or two there. Take those classes just as seriously mm -hmm. um, because all of those grades count um, when LSAC is calculating your GPA. 
And a lot of times folks don't realize that. And they're like, what do you mean? My degree GPA is a three nine. Um, but the reality of it is that you have these other classes that you did just enough to get by because you didn't need them for your major. Um, and so those have a lasting impact. And so think about those things. Um, for those who are what we call our non-traditional students, which that was me, um, so don't feel bad at all. You are not alone. We have plenty of, of applicants coming through that are taking um, life opportunities before coming to law school. Um, if you have graduate and professional degrees, um, while we don't count those GPAs, they can show me something, right? They're showing me your ability to be successful, academically successful at a graduate and professional level. Mm -hmm. um, so having quality GPAs there is also gonna be really important mm -hmm. um, because again, that's showing me some information, right? When the admissions committee is reviewing, they can say like, okay, undergraduate wasn't that great. You know, they didn't shine that much, but when they got to graduate school, they definitely did something. Mm -hmm. That being said, if you do not have a strong GPA, I am not saying that you should go get a master's, okay? Right. <laughs> that isn't necessarily going to help you. It isn't necessarily going to increase your chances in being admitted because again, that graduate GPA isn't counted. That isn't what we report, right? Um, and that's that's that reportable L, uh, GPA that we're talking about. Um, but what I am saying is if you have it, it can help, right? Just like mm -hmm. having strong letters of recommendation can help. Um, but I do not recommend going to get a master's degree or any other graduate level degree as a pathway to law school. OK, um, and so I just want to make sure that we're clear on that. Um, but it can make a difference um, when you're talking about if it's something that just happened to be a part of your journey to law school and not something that you're doing intentionally. Absolutely. And I think all of that's right. I mean, we'll we'll get transcripts from all your post-secondary academic institutions, all your LSAT scores. It'll be put together in that credential assembly service report. And then we get that master GPA, right, that LSAT gives us. But that only includes the undergraduate grades, right? I mean, we, they don't calculate your master's degree grades in that number. So it can be helpful, right, for you and at least for us to see the student that you are today, right? Maybe as opposed to the student that you were at the beginning or the middle of your undergraduate career. Uh, but it's not gonna be something that's dispositive, right, of you know your fitness for uh, legal education. So all of that is great advice per the usual. Uh, so let's talk about that second question. And, um, you know, I think we'll talk a little bit differently about this because I know at UNC you all maybe approach uh, the personal statement piece a little bit differently. Right. Uh, but I think there are some general things that are pretty consistent. Right. I mean, in the format, the voice should probably be a narrative voice. Right. I mean, you are telling us a story about you painting a picture for us uh, as uh, one of our shared colleagues says. Right. It's. Uh, about who you are and why are you here, right? Is, mm -hmm. you know, sort of how you should be thinking about uh, framing your personal statement. Uh, length, I think, can depend on the institution you choose. Here at Wayne, I think we prefer something in the two to three page range. There are some places that prefer longer, right? I don't know, UNC, do you all want more pages, less pages? Um, so technically you have up to eight pages um, for a personal statement, but it's because we have four different personal statement prompts. Um, so you can write four pages for the first two and four pages for the second two. I would absolutely appreciate if you all did not give me an eight page personal statement because that's eight pages I have to read. Mm -hmm. um, but absolutely, if you have eight pages of a story to tell me, then I am going to read all eight of your pages. But I would greatly appreciate it if you probably kept a little bit smaller. And truth be told, majority of our students are somewhere in the two to four page range, depending on how many of our personal statement prompts they respond to. Absolutely. Uh, and I think this is sort of a good place to sort of pause and suggest that for any institution that you are considering, you should understand the parameters of their application, right? Um, we are all unique institutions and we all have sort of things that we may be looking for in the process that can be different, specifically as it relates to this second question, right? I mean, the first part, we all want to see your GPA, we all want to see your LSAT score, and the expectation it is, is that it's going to look the same way in the Credential Assembly Service Report. Uh, but the real sort of place where you can, you know, where we all, we are able to influence the process and you all are able to influence the process is in this second piece. And so there's a little bit more room across institutions for you to show up differently 
based on what they're asking about. Institutions may have prompts for the personal statement that they would like for you to respond to, right? So if you're struggling to figure out what to talk about, that can be a very easy way for you to figure out what the expectations are and how you might wanna focus uh, your personal statement. I think overall, right, the spirit of your personal statement should be positive, right? And what I mean by that is if you're, if uh, part of your story is uh, a challenge that's happened, uh, sort of a hard scrabble upbringing or, you know, some things about your life that weren't necessarily great, right? I think if you can help us understand the why on that. So why, what does that mean about who you are today? How has that driven your decision making? How has that helped you chart your path, right? How did you overcome those things to achieve whatever you've achieved? I think that's a good way to think about uh, talking about challenging subjects is so so now what right so this happened to you and now what is as a result of that uh, and so I encourage people to try to keep the tone positive um, because I think it can be helpful that way uh, you can elect to write about diversity in there if you want to I think I get that question pretty frequently but check to see if an institution will allow you to submit a separate diversity statement right. Um, because those can be a place where you can have that conversation and reserve the personal statement to talk about yourself in that broader sense or in a different way, right? The personal statement is really sort of stands in for the interview, right? Uh, and it gives an, a committee an opportunity to get to know you better. And if there are things about you that are more important, right, than your diversity, then you might want to reserve that space in the personal statement and see if there is a separate diversity statement you can write that will allow you to unpack that too. And it's the last bullet point here, but it's probably one of the most important aspects uh, of the personal statement is uh, it being a measure of your ability to write. Uh, and it should be a professional piece of writing. So if you're still an undergrad and you've got a writing center on campus or uh, an English professor or somebody who writes for a living, right, that can take a look at your personal statement and make sure that it's a tight piece of writing, doesn't have spelling or grammatical errors, syntax errors, subject verb agreement issues, tense issues, right? Some of these things that when we're writing and telling our own story, uh, you might miss, right? Uh, I think it's, it's really good to get a second set of eyes, a third set of eyes, maybe even a fourth set of eyes on that personal statement to really make sure uh, that you're making the best case for yourself and painting the best picture of who you are uh, in that document. Uh, resume as well. So I think students typically can, you know, make some headway for themselves in the resume space by unpacking what they've done beyond the classroom, right? I think schools can be looking for leadership, uh, work experience, volunteer experience, all of the different things that you've done outside the classroom, how your passions show up, right? And the things that you choose to do beyond your degree. I mean, we wanna see your work history, typically in reverse chronological order. Uh, if you're a professional and you've got a, a long storied career, uh, don't feel obligated to truncate that, right? I mean, if this is what you've accomplished and this is what you've done, uh, feel free to share that with us. I think uh, the other piece of it is that if you don't have a super long resume, it doesn't change the story. If you're coming directly from undergrad, I think the expectation is that your resume is probably gonna be a little shorter just because you haven't done as much, but you've accomplished some things, you've done some things outside the classroom, and that's a good place for you to capture that. Uh, and a piece that I want to touch on too is that uh, avoid making your personal statement sort of a restatement of what yep. you've done outside <laughs> the classroom, right? Um, you know, I, I've, I think Michelle's probably seen some and I've seen some uh, personal statements too where I am I feel like I'm not sure which document I'm reading, right? Mm -hmm. Am I reading the resume here or am I reading the personal statement? Uh, if some of the experiences that you've had uh, sort of fit into that question of who you are and why are you here, I think it makes sense uh, to include it, but don't feel obligated to simply recount, right, what you've accomplished outside of the classroom as a part of that resume. Uh, the letters of recommendation, right, we've talked about those multiple times, so I won't spend too much time on it here, um, but I think that about, you know, you should think about where you are in the process when you're thinking about who you ask to write the letters for you. If you're a recent graduate, I would say, you know, a few years out or, or less, 
you should really try to find somebody from who taught you in a classroom, right? To talk about your intellectual abilities and your academic performance, because I think on admissions committees, faculty sit on those and they want to see uh, what their peers in the profession sort of think about you and how you show up in that classroom, because that's what they'll experience. If you don't have them, right, there are institutions that will accept your application without them. For us at Wayne, if you're less than two years out, so two years or less, right, we have to have at least one of your letters of recommendation come from somebody who's taught you in a classroom. Hmm. Um, so, and the reason that we want that is because you, the most recent thing you've been, right, and the thing you've been for the longest is a student, uh, and that's how we're evaluating you, right? Um, so, you're also free to choose employers, right, people who know you and love you, not mom and dad, right? You, that's, uh, we've seen those too, right? The mom and dad letters of recommendation that aren't necessarily <laughs> insightful because mom and dad love you and they want to see you do this, so it's not as informative. Uh, but if you've got, again, employers, professional references, uh, mentors, people who love you and believe in you, right, who want to see you do this, I think you can submit those letters as well. The number of letters is going to depend on the institution, too. Uh, for us, it's at least two, but no more than four. And I think that's probably true of uh, a good number of places, right? We want to see a couple, but we don't want to see 12, right? That's, and I don't know, uh, UNC, how many would you all like to see? We require two, we accept up to three. Absolutely. See, so somewhere between that two and four range is the sweet spot. I think two is probably good in most cases. Um, so, yeah, so that's the letters of recommendation. Again, they can influence this part of the conversation. Uh, so let's touch on addenda since we're here. Uh, the, the who's, the what's, the where's, the why's on those. Uh, typically, uh, the, you do an addendum when there's a contextual opportunity, right, around a red flag in your application. So uh, like Michelle touched on, if uh, let's say theoretically you had a bad semester academically, right, and that shows up in your record and there was a reason why that was the case, or there's something that you need to share with us about why uh, you had that bad semester, I think that's a good place to submit an addendum. Uh, I think in the uh, in an opposite context, right? If the LSAT, you know, if you took an LSAT and it wasn't great and your subsequent score was better, or if you took one LSAT and the score was great and then the next one was not as great, right? Help us understand what happened there, right? Why was there a drastic change uh, between those numbers, right? Uh, and provide that context. In some cases, students look at their profile and say, oh, well, my GPA is really strong but my LSAT isn't great. And I think you all should use my, my GPA as the true indicator of my academic potential. And so they'll submit an addendum that articulates the reasons why that is. Uh, there's a whole universe of uh, aspiring law students who are not great test takers or who buy into the idea, right? That they aren't great test takers. Uh, and so they want to share that with us and help us understand what you know, their academic performance means and how it's more valuable or Maybe undergrad was not their best work, right? Uh, but they demonstrated a high level of aptitude through the LSAT, and they believe that that's a better measure uh, of who they are and where they are. And the other piece, too, is uh, character and fitness. Uh, and you'll hear more and more about this as you continue to go through uh, the law school application process. And certainly when you become law students, uh, you'll learn, you'll hear more about character and fitness. Uh, most law schools, I would say all of them at this point, have questions on their application that are related to character and fitness, right? Uh, so if you, you know, it'll be criminal stuff or anything that they may ask you. Uh, and if you answer affirmatively to those character and fitness questions that you've been disciplined academically or uh, ran afoul of the law, right, uh, they're going to want to see an addendum that explains what happened, right? So what's the story there? Where does that thing stand today, right? Uh, what was your what was uh, going on at that time that sort of caused that to happen? Uh, part of the reason why you have to do it on the front end is that you'll have to do it on the back end, right? So at the end of this process, when you finish with law school and you're ready to go out uh, expeditiously to become a young eager attorney, you'll have to apply to sit for a bar exam in a state and they're going to want to know everything about your life, basically, up to that point. 
uh, and they'll be checking on these character and fitness related things, right? And it's good to disclose them in the front end of the process uh, because if you don't and it comes out on the back end, the, law, the state bar is going to ask you, why didn't you share this with the law school you applied to, right? Uh, I tell students all the time to err on the side of disclosure as it relates to character and fitness stuff. If you think it's something that you should share, uh, I say share it, right, and put it out there so that there's no question mark about it at the end of the process. But Michelle, any thoughts on that? No, um, absolutely. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to the law schools and say, hey, I just want to see if this qualifies. Um, and be very careful because some law schools are required little things like you have to report speeding tickets compared to law schools maybe in that same state that don't require it. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be something that is tricky. And so make sure that you're really taking the time to read each question and don't gloss over it um, and making sure that you are giving the correct answer. And remember that saying yes to character and fitness does not give you an automatic no in admissions. Absolutely. Um, and I think that that's a fear for a lot of students like, oh man, I have this speeding ticket. I have this minor in possession from when, you know, three years ago, whatever the case may be. Um, most of the time, character and fitness responses that are a yes aren't an issue, but sometimes they are. And we sometimes just need to be able to are. figure it out. Yeah. We just need to be able to walk you through that process and figure out sometimes there's things that a student can do while they're in law school to help repair them and put them in a good position. Um, and sometimes there are other things that we need to address. But a lot of times, and I'm, I hope this is the same for you guys. Most of the time, the character fitness ones that I see come across my my desk are really minor. They're minor in possessions. They're minor alcohol related offenses. There are speeding tickets, traffic tickets, things of that nature um, that just tell me that you lived a little bit of life. Yeah, um, and, so, <laughs> and so it's not a concern. Absolutely. And, and I think that's true. I mean, I don't see very rarely do I see something that I say, huh, that's going to be a problem. Right. right. I mean, so. Uh, you know, disclose the stuff. You know, we recognize that uh, people make choices all the time that, that uh, may be challenging. Right. And so uh, you just share what happened, share where, where you are. And, you know, we hope that you've grown from it. Right. As a result. Uh, and we'll evaluate you fairly and even handedly. All right. Uh, so we talked about the addendum piece. So we'll move on from that part of the process. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the character and fitness piece, again, we just talked about it. Err on the side of disclosure. Be truthful. Take time to reflect. You've got a duty to disclose throughout the application process and throughout law school. So if, you know, just because you got into law school and you disclose a speeding ticket, you can't not disclose another speeding ticket if you get it in law school. So whatever happens to you in law school that sort of fits into that character and fitness space you should probably disclose that right while you're in law school because it's going to come up in the in your in your bar application and they'll have questions about why that wasn't shared so just make sure you're keeping the law school apprised of what happens to you uh, i won't say that a school is you know not it's not 100 percent like if it's something crazy right you could have some tough questions to answer uh, but if it's the kinds of things that happen to people right just in in course of doing things uh, you should be fine with that institution. Uh, and then again, to Michelle's point, if you've got a question, ask, right? Don't rely on your gut, right? A law school will let you know, right? If it's something that they feel like you should disclose uh, and you should uh, follow those instructions. All right, so application timing. We talked about this rolling admissions at most institutions. Uh, you should confirm with each school that you're applying to their admissions deadlines. Most places will have a priority sort of application period that's typically tied to scholarship consideration. Uh, so you should be aware of what that is. I know for us at Wayne, uh, our priority scholarship deadline typically falls in mid-March. This year, for next year, it'll be March 15th, I believe. Uh, Michelle, do you all have priority scholarship deadlines at UNC? We do. We actually have two. So the first one is the consideration for our full tuition scholarship program. You have to have a completed application by December 31st. So for those who are considering and want to be considered for the full tuition scholarship, um, you have just a little over a month to get a completed application in. Um, and then the second one is also going to be a March 15th, which is the priority. Um, so by that time, we are the scholarship funds are a little bit thinner. Yeah. Um, and so we want to make sure that you want to you want to make sure that if you want to get the best scholarship offer possible uh, to have your application in before that time. Absolutely. Sounds good. So, 
Uh, let's move to the question and answer portion because I know people hey. have things they want to know. Uh, I've got a list of questions here in front of me, so we'll just sort of go through those first. And if uh, people have questions, feel free to enter those into the live chat, and we will uh, definitely address those in kind. So uh, one of the questions that I have is asking about trends in performance and grades. So uh, if somebody's got a declining trend in their grades, should they address that in their personal statement? And you know, I think we've been pretty consistent in sharing that the addendum is really a place where you want to talk about uh, grade trends and performance. So my advice would be to submit a separate addendum and really use that as the space to help us understand, you know, any trends in your academic performance. Uh, Michelle, do you, what, are, what are your thoughts? Uh, exactly the same. The other thing I would say is also um, it's one thing to tell me about it. It's another thing to show me how you would address it if it were to happen in law school. Mm -hmm. um, so I always give the example, like, let's say for whatever reason life happened and you didn't withdraw from classes properly or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what impacted your GPA. Life may happen again in law school. Um, and so what are you going to do in law school? Like, can you talk about, oh, now I know I need to contact, you know, a staff member, the dean of students, and get assistance, or you know, I need to communicate with my professors what's going on so that I can get the support that I need. Um, that is also really helpful and beneficial as a part of your agenda, right? Um, is is showing me that you now know how to handle that situation because life will happen in law school. I guarantee it. Um, but I also need to know that if whatever happened in undergrad, you know how to at least address the situation and get the support that you need while you're in law school. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I got another question about international GPAs and, and degrees and how that's equated. So uh, the question is really about scholarship, right? And so this is somebody who will be coming to the process with uh, an international school's GPA, which will be converted by LSAC and given that rating, right? So how do uh, we sort of look at the scholarship prospects based on that? Uh, and I'm going to be transparent. I mean, I I don't think we treat it necessarily differently, right? I mean, we're looking at the same factors to make the decision in terms of making that scholarship decision. And we want to feel that uh, you've accomplished enough academically and perform well enough on the LSAT for us to feel, you know, that this is the right approach to scholarship, right? So we're not going to treat it uh, as if it's something other than what it is, which is either good grades or not good grades. So um, but I don't know at UNC how you all is. Do you all have like a calculus that you use to evaluate or how it works? Uh, so it, they are merit based scholarships. So LSAT and GPA do matter. Um, I wish I could say it was this perfect grid where I could just yeah. put in your GPA and your LSAT and tell you exactly what the scholarship amount was. But it's not that perfect. Um, but for our international students, they are considered for scholarships the exact same way. Yeah. I do have the ability to have a good idea of what your um, GPA would be if you had attended an institution in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and also I have your LSAT score. So with that information, um, you are compared to students and awarded just like students who had similar numbers. Absolutely. All right. So a FAFSA question, which we don't typically get in these kinds mm -hmm. of conversations, but uh, when should I complete the FAFSA and other financial aid information? Uh, I think as soon as you're ready, right? I mean, when the application for FAFSA opens and you know your intent is to start law school that uh, in, during that academic year, I think you should fill out your FAFSA and have it done. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think people come to it at different stages of the process. I have people that wait until after they're admitted, right, to decide to fill out a FAFSA uh, and they're fine. I think it just depends on, you know, sort of your handle on the process, right? But I don't know, Michelle, any advice from you on that? Um, just a couple of reminders. In law school, you are an independent student. You're in professional mm -hmm. school, so your parents' information isn't counted. And so there, and there aren't a whole lot of um, need-based grants and things like that at the graduate and professional level. So if you're thinking I need to apply early because there won't be enough Pell Grant or, or whatever right. is out there, there really isn't any in law school. <laughs> um, so, so that's why we're saying it really doesn't matter when you apply for the um, FAFSA because that is going to for the most part, um, and for most institutions, it is only going to address 
um, federal loans that you're eligible for, um, which is also very helpful to understand what you're eligible for. Um, if you need to do some things to fix credit in order to qualify for plus, graduate plus loans and things of that nature, it is helpful if you had that information early on um, and that you can kind of do the rehabilitation process so that you can put yourself in a good position to qualify for some of those other loans if you need them. Um, and understanding kind of an overall what your financial responsibility is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, but applications for FAFSA opens in October. Yep. So you can apply, you could be applying right now if that's yep. something that you're interested in. But you could also apply two days before classes begin. Just know that you won't get money for a significant amount of time yeah. um, if you wait that late. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right. So I got somebody who applied last year to a school and didn't get accepted, improved LSAT score, uh, and intends to reapply. Uh, how important is it uh, that they write a new and different personal statement, or should they? Is it okay for them to resubmit uh, the same personal statement they submitted the previous year? Uh, I'm going to kick this to you first, Michelle, because I'm really interested as to what you uh, you have to say on this one. Yeah, um, I always encourage reapplicants to give me a new application, right? Because one, if I see that you've applied and that you were um, that you applied a second time, I will always go back and look at your previous application. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something I do. I can't guarantee that all admissions professionals do that, but that's something I definitely do because I want to know, did you give me a new application, right? Um, are you expecting a different result with the same information? Mm -hmm. um, very few times does that really make a difference, right? Unless you, you applied at the deadline last year and you're applying early this year, that's probably the only way um, that can make a big difference for someone. Right. But otherwise, then I am looking for freshness. You might still be talking about the same topics. You might still be um, kind of having the same subject matter, but have you gone back and looked at the application again? Because this is a new year and mm -hmm. hopefully I'm seeing a um, new and improved view. Absolutely, and I think that's right. I mean, you're not the same person you are the last time you applied, even if it feels that way, there's something about you that is different, right? And I think that's a you know a really easy way for you to continue to show that growth, right? Because the, the LSAT score alone, right, isn't necessarily the only thing that determines admission. It's a whole person process, right? And I think you have to be thoughtful about the person you show yourself to be in this process. Are you being thoughtful? Are you being you know patient? Are you making the best case for yourself? in this process. And I think that would be best made with a fresh personal statement in the application for a new application, even if you're reapplying. All right, so uh, let's see, next question here. Uh, so this is for, for somebody who's seasoned, a professional who graduated from undergrad a few decades ago, right? Uh, so how do you talk, how do you think somebody should talk about their unique real world experiences in their application and in that personal statement process, right? How do you sort of frame that? How do you have that conversation? How do you talk about your real world experiences driving your decision making process um, in, in a personal statement, right? Do you do it as a diversity statement? Like, how do you really make that case for yourself as a seasoned professional? I'm going to leave it to you first, Michelle. Thanks. Um, I think there's a couple of ways to do it. Well, a lot of times when I think about um, how people address the the kind of the first prompt in our personal statement, which is kind of like, why do you want to go to law school and why now? Um, I think when you're talking about like, there's a major influence that's bringing you to law school at this point in your life, whether this is the first time I've had the chance to be able to dedicate myself, like I made sure that I dedicated to my family. And so I had made some sacrifices for my personal goals in order to make sure that they were good. And now that they're good, I'm taking this opportunity because this is what I've always wanted to do. Whether it's I had um, a recent experience with the law that made me realize that this is the way I need to go, whatever your story is, that's where you should tell it. Um, and I think depending on what your story is depends on the appropriate place for it to go, whether that is in the personal statement, whether that's in the diversity statement, um, and maybe you're addressing those in two different ways, right? So maybe there's some life experiences that you're talking about in the personal statement, and maybe the diversity statement is actually talking about, I have all of these years of experience, I have all of these um, years that I'm bringing in, so what should I, um, and this is what I'm bringing to your institution, and this is how I'm going to create a diverse class for you. Yeah, I think all of that's right. And, and you know, there's a follow-up question here about the, the GPA 
right, which is not as strong of a GPA. And how does that, how do, how do, how does a law school admissions committee and admissions professional sort of look at a GPA that's maybe not strong, but from decades ago, right? And I know when I look at that, I'm thinking, well, I'm, pr I'm pretty confident you're not the same student or person, you know, today that you were 30 years ago. I can't get away from having to look at that, right, as a part of the process, right? So I can't dismiss it as out of hand, but I think it puts me in a position where if need be, I can advocate and say, hey, look, this is not the same person who was in school right. 30 years ago. I think they probably matured, have a better handle. And sometimes these are people who've had a professional degree or a graduate degree between the time they finished undergrad and the time they're deciding to apply to law school, right? So you can look at that and say, well, if those grades are good, they're probably closer to being this student than they are to being the one who maybe didn't have a great undergraduate career. Um, you know, but it's a whole person process, right? So, you know, to Michelle's point, that experience matters, right? The way you tell that story matters, and it really helps us understand who you are in the classroom, and there's value in that. So uh, don't worry. Don't feel like you can't apply or that you have to, like, explain away this who you were 30 years ago, because I don't think that's necessary. We'll evaluate you on the merits, uh, you know, and if you're a good fit, uh, we'll extend you that offer of admission. Uh, all right. So can either of us look at somebody's personal statement, like review a personal statement? Uh, I know I can't do it. I don't know, Michelle, if you all do it. No, we unfortunately do not review personal statements, um, partly because I am also part of the committee that helps to review applications. And so that kind of gives somebody an unfair advantage if I'm Absolutely. telling you how to how to give that information. Um, but I do encourage you to reach out to pre-law advisors, to family members. It does not have to be um, anyone in particular. Anyone can that can read um, and give you quality feedback could read your personal statement and help give you some guidance there. Absolutely. Sounds good. All right. So uh, next question, what kind of academic backgrounds do uh, law schools prefer? Uh, there's an emphasis on STEM these days, but the assumption in this question is that humanities and fine arts uh, uh, better prepare students for the academic requirements of law school. And I think uh, I just had this conversation yesterday with a group of students and I said, it takes all kinds, right? To make a law school class sort of work. Uh, I think what we want more than anything is for you to choose a major or a program that matters to you and then to do well in it, right? I mean, that's right. the most important thing. If you uh, are a music theory major, be the best music theory major that you can be demonstrate that aptitude in the classroom and we'll evaluate you that way. Um, you know, I think traditionally we see more of the humanities and liberal arts students sort of applying in this space. We would love to have more STEM majors uh, applying to our programs uh, because there is a lot of opportunity out there uh, for folks with that background to translate those skills into ways that are helpful in the legal profession. Uh, but I think it's most important for you to do well in whatever you choose. Michelle? Exactly what you said. All right. Good deal. Good deal. All right. So next question. So what do we consider to be a winning personal statement? Like what and what should be included and not included in the diversity statement? So what is a winning personal statement? Ooh, a winning personal statement. Um, I always say I look for a quality personal statement, right? Mm -hmm. Because everybody has their own story. And so there's not a way to say like this one is better than the next one. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm looking for one that I can tell that they thought through, one that has been edited, that is quality grammar and syntax and all the things that we've been talking about. Um, but it's not necessarily, I don't need a Mount Everest story, right? right. Um, you don't have to cure cancer. You don't have to have anything that is necessarily unique and special, but it has to be you because you are unique and special. Absolutely. And I think that's right. I mean, the most important thing, you know, I look for authenticity, right? I mean, I, mm -hmm. I want to feel like this is your story I'm being told and not somebody else's. Uh, I'm looking for polish, right? I want to feel like I'm reading uh, a professional document, right? One that you uh, have given time and attention to that sort of reflects the importance and the gravity of the decision that we're making, right? Uh, and I think I need to know who you are. Like I have to get, I have to come away from this personal statement saying, "Huh, we need this person in this class because 
I've learned these things about them that we know will be valuable. So uh, that's sort of my approach to looking at personal statements and how we do them. Uh, and so I think that's what a winning personal statement looks like, right? It's one that's polished, right? That's your story that gives the, uh, the people reviewing your application an understanding of who you are beyond what you've accomplished academically in a classroom. I think if you can hit those buttons, right, help us understand those things, and it's a, a pretty good statement in terms of what should be and should not be included in a diversity statement. Uh, I would say the things that you wrote in your personal statement, right? I mean, it shouldn't be a sort of a, re, a revisiting of your personal statement. If there are things about yourself uh, that you believe to be unique and diverse, the diversity statement is a place for you to tell that story. Uh, I think if it's, you know, if you don't feel like those things exist in your life, then don't feel obligated to uh, submit a diversity statement just for the sake of submitting one. Uh, I know there's some advice out there that says uh, that you should, right? And I've heard students say that. Somebody told me that if a diversity statement is accepted, I should absolutely submit it. And my advice is you only submit that if you have that story to tell. If that's not your story, then don't feel an obligation to share it. Uh, so, so this is a, a, an addendum question, and I think we get these because people are trying to figure out how to use them, right? What are, what are these tools and how do I apply it? Uh, so how do I explain that, you know, that I haven't necessarily been working, but I've been a working artist, right? And now I've decided that I want to go to law school. So there's probably some gaps in the resume, right, that don't necessarily reflect what you've been doing with the time. Uh, is Should you submit an addendum, right, that it helps explain those gaps in the resume? Uh, and that's a really good question. I mean, I think if, if I was putting together the resume, and I was a working artist for a period, I would put in my resume that I was a working artist, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, you know, just because you aren't working in a traditional sense doesn't mean you aren't working. So don't feel like that's something that a law school is gonna treat differently, right, than other experience. I mean, if you're a working artist, the presumption is that you were trying to put, to advance your art and you've decided that you wanna do this. So don't even leave room for you to need an addendum, just put it in your resume and, and, right. and leave it up that way. All right. So is an academic letter of recommendation required? Uh, we've talked about that specifically for Wayne. If you're uh, two years or less from graduation, absolutely. Uh, UNC, you all don't require one, right? We do not require one, but I do highly encourage, especially like I said, if you're within at least a year of graduation yeah. um, or, or currently in undergrad during the application is that you should have a letter of recommendation from a professor. Absolutely. All right. So how should I approach addendums for non-academic or academic suspensions and probation? Uh, so I've seen these. I know you've seen them too, Michelle. Any thoughts about what, uh, how a student should approach having that conversation about uh, suspensions or probation? Um, well, remember that you might be addressing this in two separate ways. One, mm -hmm. it might be under the character and fitness if you had to answer yes to that particular law school. And that one is probably going to be more of a factual, like who, what, where, when, and why, right? I was placed on academic suspicion in the fall of 2017. Um, in spring of 2018, I came off of suspension because I got my GPA up and there weren't any other issues. But you might also address it in your personal addendum when you're talking about um, the reason why I was placed on academic suspension is because this portion of what happened or whatever the case may be. Um, so you might be addressing it twice, um, but in different ways and in different manners. One is going to be more factual when you're talking about the character and fitness side of things. And one's going to give me a better understanding of that situation and, and why it happened. And again, talking about maybe um, what you could do to prevent that from happening again or for, prevent those actions um, from all coming together again. Absolutely. All right, so next question here, do the specific classes we take matter to an admissions professional? If we chose some harder electives, would that be taken into consideration? Uh, and I think, yeah, right? I mean, at rigor of the program, the courses that you chose is absolutely in consideration, uh, right? If, if the GPA overall isn't particularly strong, right? I don't think that the rigor of the classes can necessarily overcome that in its entirety, right? But I think it is a consideration, right? I mean, if, you, if you're if you a 3.3 with a degree in biomedical engineering, right, uh, versus somebody who's maybe a 3.8 in 
basket weaving, right? Well, we recognize that these engineering courses probably present a challenge that's different than those basket weaving courses might. Uh, so we're looking at the entire body of what you did in undergrad to determine what that GPA tells us about your ability to be successful. So if you took two chemistry classes and you got A's in those two chemistry classes, but the rest of your grades aren't great, we can't say, all right, well, you got two A's in chemistry, so it, it, it's a shoe in for you to be successful. Um, so I think it really is about the story of your academic career and all of the parts that go into what your GPA is that helps us make that choice. And also remember that as well versus we try to be about all of the institutions where we have and receive applications, um, I don't know specifically if this class or this particular professor is necessarily harder than the other. Um, right. And so I don't necessarily know down to that level, um, but like Justin is talking about, like generally majors, I kind of know majors across the board. Generally, you know, for institutions where we receive a lot of applications, I have a good idea of what a quality GPA from that institution looks like. Um, and so keep that in mind that I don't necessarily know if you took logic with Professor Jones um, compared to logic with Professor Smith, that those were significantly harder courses. Yeah, and, and we're getting a, a good number of questions about addendums. So I think maybe just take, I'm gonna take a step back and talk about them really quickly again. I mean, I think the addendum piece is uh, if you have character and fitness issues, right, it's not discretionary, right? If something has happened to you and you answer affirmatively, you have to share details about that thing uh, with the law school. Most schools are going to want to see, some, maybe you want to see the court documents, right? If it was a criminal offense or something that involved the law, the court documents could be helpful. I think if you are in a position where you are able to explain the situation and what you've learned, Right. I think that can be beneficial because we will want to see that growth. We'll want to see you having taken ownership of right the choices that you made and the positions that you put yourself in. Uh, I think it reflects poorly right on a student when I get one of these and it's, you know, what well, everybody else was a problem and I was just an innocent bystander and I had nothing to do with it. Right. Um, so I think that's the context in which you maybe aren't using it as well as you could be, um, you know, and there's a question in here about why do you need to disclose things that happen to you while you're in law school? Uh, because you have to keep people in the loop, right? And the, and the expectation from, for you from the state bar is that you will keep the law school in the loop as to what's happening while you're in uh, the profession. Your professional reputation begins the day you get your, le your letter of admission to law school. And so I think the, the state bar sort of approach it that way and that when you are a lawyer, you will have to disclose, right? When a thing happens, when you run afoul of the law, when a, when a challenge happens that uh, maybe rises to that level, you'll have to disclose that. And that's, that's just the nature of the beast, right? Uh, so if you wanna do this, right, you have to be prepared for the fact that you're gonna have to share more about your life than maybe you ever have before. Um, as, as, a, as a benefit of the privilege. So I uh, just wanted to touch on that stuff broadly. Uh, if you've got a suspended license, yes, you need to tell, uh, you need to explain what happened with that. If you don't recall the time period, then you need to go to your local DMV or secretary of state or whoever maintains your driving records and request a copy of your driving records. They will mm -hmm. do that for you. You're gonna have to do it anyway. When you go to go for, go for the bar exam, you're going to have to pull your driver record. So it's good that you'll at least know where to go, right? If you do it now, so pull your driving record. Make sure that you're put the dates match up, that you understand what's on your history, right? Uh, so that when you're disclosing these things, it's actual and it's factual. But any thoughts from you, just broadly about the the character and fitness piece? Yeah, um, just report it. It's yeah. really and truly just just tell me just do it. because I'd much rather get the information and say, oh, I didn't need to know that. than you having to come back and amend your application, which is what happens every single year. There's someone who didn't listen to one of these talks um, and then they come back in and they say, um, Ms. Michelle, I need to make an addendum on my application because sometime during orientation, the first week of classes, um, there will be someone from the state bar who will come to your university, your law school, and they will come speak. And then they will tell you all the things that happen if you don't disclose this information. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to go have to have to go back and say something. Mm -hmm. um, and you're going to have to go back and fix it. So it's just much easier if you're unsure, like I said, contact the institution individually, 
but more likely than not, they're going to tell you to go ahead and report it. Um, mm -hmm. Even if they're like, even if they're pretty sure they're going to say, you know what, just go ahead and, and report it. Just put it on there and, and we'll deal with it later. Um, because more likely than not, it doesn't matter for the application process. It's not going to affect your admissions, but they have to have that information. Yeah. Uh, and so, again, I think we talked about the letters of recommendation piece. Uh, this is somebody who's got an academic advisor who they feel like will uh, write a better letter than some of their past professors, but didn't teach them in class, knows them in some other ways. Is that OK? I think so. Right. Depending on. But again, you have to ask the institution what their expectations are. Ours is a pretty rigid standard. If you are less, if you're two years or less, it's got to be from a professor. I know you've got the academic advisor that lo that you love, who's a uh, you know who has been a great resource for you. We need to see some. We need to hear from somebody that's had you in their classroom. It's what our faculty expect. It's what they believe is really useful to them and helping to evaluate you as a student. But again, this goes back to that point. You need to be talking to the places that you plan to apply to about what their expectations are around the application, so that you don't leave any question marks or have to go back right, uh, and try to find a thing or do a thing differently. Yeah. Uh, all right, so somebody who uh, was had some academic challenges, uh, GPA isn't particularly great, but made Dean's List the last two semesters, and they're sort of worried that they won't get, in, get into any school at this point in the cycle, and uh, they're looking for some advice. Uh, any advice from you, Michelle, to the person who struggled academically, fixed it at the end, but has some concerns now about how things might play out? Um, I think the first thing is identifying what schools are going to be good options, right? What schools are going to be target schools, what schools are going to be reach schools. So some of that is going to be using the LSAC um, admissions predictor. I think the next thing is making sure that you write a good addendum, right? Um, so if you're just talking about like, it just took me a minute. Like I wasn't ready to go to college when I went, but I didn't have many options. Parents said you need to go or you need to get out. And so I mm -hmm. chose to go um, and whatever that may be. And I've seen it happen time and time again. And I've seen folks who've been admitted. Um, so don't get discouraged because you're concerned about the GPA, you're concerned about those things, um, but really be more targeted and focused. Um, and that might even be reaching out to those particular law schools that you're interested in um, and kind of finding out like, what's the range of Apple, you know, GPAs and LSAT scores that you admit. Um, you can find a lot of that information posted on their websites, um, whether it's they're talking about their entering class statistics, whether they're talking about the ABA disclosures, um, using that information to kind of help give you an idea of where am I going to be best fit? Um, so don't get discouraged. Um, there, you are still relatively early in the application cycle for most schools. Um, and so I don't think that you are going to be at a disadvantage, but I think it's gonna be um, important for you to use the addendum correctly um, mm -hmm. and to really explain what's going on and where you are now and how this is going to carry on into your law school career. Absolutely, and I think that's right. I mean, every, every year, and I think students sometimes will look at a median Right. And decide that because they don't have those exact numbers that they've got no shot. I mean, really what a median is, is that if you crack the class open and dug right in the middle and pulled the student out. Right. It's very likely that these are the numbers that their academic profile would show. And, and there are numbers on both sides of that. And so you have to be conscious of uh, the fact that law schools are building classes. We're not building factories of the exact same person. Right. Who's who comes to law school in the exact same way with the exact same story. Law schools are, are sort of mixing bowls, right, of people who come from different places with different backgrounds, with different stories, different academic accomplishments. Uh, and so apply to the places you want to go to and give them an opportunity to evaluate you on your merits. Don't discount yourself before we've been ha given an opportunity to read your application and make that decision. I'm sure there are things about you that are very compelling that would give a law school reason to consider you for their class. Mm -hmm. We just need to hear that story. I think a good addendum, right, can be useful in helping us understand who you were then versus who you are now and why the now version of you is the best representation of who you are. Uh, you can't get away from what that number is, right? But what you can help a law school do is understand why that number is and what that means for who you are now. Like, hey, look, oh, that first three years I was in 
uh, I was in the zone, right? I don't even know where I was. I, you know, I was I chose the wrong program, right? Because that happens. There are so many people who were pre med majors <laughs> uh, who decide somewhere along the way, typically in biochemistry, that they are no longer cut out for it, right? And they change programs and they find their footing. So uh, give yourself some credit, right? And have a little faith in yourself. Mm -hmm. um, you are probably better positioned than you think you are. The most important thing is for you to apply and give schools an opportunity to uh, evaluate you on your own merit. Uh, so this is a Wayne specific question about our priority scholarship deadline and so the timeline of applying. Uh, so the March 15th is the date, right? So it doesn't matter if you apply on March 15th or before March 15th, as long as you have your application in by that date, uh, then you will be given the fullest possible consideration. So if you uh, are looking for that full tuition scholarship, as long as the application is in before or on March 15th, you'll receive that fullest possible consideration. And I think that's probably too, true in most places, right? We're not mm -hmm. like, all right, if you turn it in on the 15th, you got we're knocking 10% off of your scholarship. I don't think it uh, works that way. I mean, we, we don't want to, uh, you know, make it a... a a dart throw, right? But it gives you enough time to get the materials in uh, and gives us enough room to make informed choices based on the money that we have, the classes that, you know, the numbers of people that have already been admitted to make that informed choice. Uh, so, Michelle, any topics that you feel are pretty generic that you see too often in the personal statement space? Not really. Um, and I, I was looking and thinking about that question. And I honestly, I can probably put most personal statements in about four different umbrellas. Um, and it's the right like I've had some kind I've always wanted to be a lawyer. Um, I've had some kind of interaction with the law, either positive or negative, And that's why I want to go to law school. Um, I want to help people. And I figured out that this is the best way for me to help people. Mm -hmm. um, or there's like the pre law, like the pre med people. Right. Like mm -hmm. went down one path, realized that that isn't it. And now here I am. Yeah. Um, so generally speaking, almost every single personal statement can probably fall underneath one of those umbrellas, but it's going to be your story. So there's always going to be a little bit something different to it. Um, so there isn't anything too generic unless you're not giving me you. Right. Um, please don't try to go online and Google like law school personal statement and copy and paste it. Right. That's <laughs> not going to be the <laughs> best way. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, I don't think that there is a generic way to answer that question because it's going to be your personal statement. Absolutely. And I think that's true. Right. I mean, even, even you know, two two people with, you know, the exact same ambitions and similar stories will have things that define them separately. And that'll show up in the personal statement. Um, you know, I don't think anything is necessarily too generic. Right. I mean, the most important thing is that it is professionally written. I can't say enough. The only the, the worst topic is the one that's poorly written. Right. I don't mm -hmm. care what you're talking about. If the writing is poor, then it's a non-starter. Right. It makes it really hard to see past that. Right. Um, to to the virtues of who you are as a person and the story that you're trying to tell. So. Uh, don't worry about the topic that you choose being too generic or one that the committee may have seen too, seen too often. Make sure it's authentically you, that it is professionally written, and that people come away from it with an understanding of who you are and why you are there. And I think if you hit that button, the topic right is 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 not going to be one that's like we've seen too often. All right. So uh, what's the value of disclosing the other schools you're applying to? Uh, schools typically have an optional question about the other places to which uh, you're applying. I'm going to be fully transparent. It's just market research for us, right? I mean, we want to know uh, the places that students who are considering us are also considering. It has no impact on the admissions decision or the application like review process. It's just good to know who, who else people are thinking about. But I don't know for you all, is it any different? You know, it's the same. And truth be told, even if you don't put it in, I can make some general assumptions. If you're a North Carolina resident and you're applying to us, more than likely you're applying to Wake Forest or Duke, maybe Campbell. Like 
I, I kind of will have a good idea of what other law schools you're applying to, or I can make some assumptions, um, but it is nice to have some confirmation. Yeah, and it's the same way for us. I know if you're applying to us, you're applying to Michigan State, you're applying to Detroit Mercy, you're probably going to take a moonshot at uh, Michigan if, you, if you're thinking about it, right? It's just the universe of schools that we know we typically compete with, and so we're not surprised by it. But every now and then, I, I do get an application, and I'm like, huh. That's an interesting uh, set of schools, right? yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but overall, I think, you know, if you don't feel comfortable answering the question, don't. Right. I mean, it's not an obligation unless a, a school makes it mandatory. And I don't think anybody really does. So uh, if it's optional, you're not obligated to fill it out. And that also doesn't change the process. We don't treat you differently because you didn't disclose the other schools you were going to apply to. Um, so it looks like that was the last question. So. I think we're all wrapped up here for the evening. The first thing I'm going to do. Yes. Did we answer the question about the value of a diversity statement when the personal statement discloses race? Oh, oh see that this is why it's good to have another set of eyes. So I'm going to leave that question to you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Never mind. No, um, the value of the diversity statement when the personal statement, I think you can address it different ways. Right. So, um, goodness, part of my personal statement when I was applying to law school talked about my experiences and working at historically black colleges and universities and how I realized that my influence and impact as a black woman would make a difference in the legal field. Right. And that was my personal statement. But that was talking about my motivation going into law school. But then when I talked about my diversity statement, my diversity statement then talked about how some of these different experiences I had as a black woman influence who I am and how that is going to come into the law classroom, right? And kind of the experiences I bring into the law classroom. So there is way there are ways that you can address these different aspects of yourself um, in ways that, and maybe in the personal statement addresses it in one way, um, but in the diversity statement, you're coming from a different perspective and talking about the value that you're adding to the institution compared to maybe the motivation that's bringing you to consider that institution. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, that's all, all indeed true. Uh, okay, looks like we got another question. Please explain what a peer reviewed resume means. Uh, not 100% certain what that is, other than I think some peers reviewing your resume. I think that's, uh, I hate to make it that plain, but I think it is, if you've got a peer who's reviewed your resume, then I would see that as a peer reviewed resume. I hope that answers the question, um, but that's the best I've got on that one. So uh, I don't know, have you ever heard of that before? No, that's, I think the first, but I think that that's a great way to start. Yeah. Um, and, and having other people review your resume. Absolutely. And I, like I said, it doesn't always have to be um, someone who is in a role um, or who has a title that can be beneficial in reviewing some of these different pieces of your application when you're talking about the resume, when you're talking about the personal statement. Um, I always say I'm somebody's auntie, right? Yeah. And so someone, um, right, I'm, I'm human, right? And yeah. that, that's the point. And so having other humans review this and give you their opinion and their thoughts and their feelings on what they receive from you is always a good thing. All right. Looks like we got another question. So folks are, are they they're like, well, I gotta get they're these listening. out. All right. Uh, so is the time out of school determined when you apply or the law school year you're applying to? I think the question is asking, does it matter how long you've been out of school when you apply? Well, I think they're saying like if you because if I apply in two years versus two and a half years. Yeah. Okay, so that's probably someone who's making sure they have their professor. Right. Yeah. Letter recommendation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's the time out of school when you apply. Right. So if you're applying for fall 2020, if you graduated in 2018 or 2019. Right. Or 2020. Right. Then we're going to want to see we're looking at like that two year like window. Right. So if you graduated in 2018, then you probably need to send us uh, a letter of recommendation from a professor, right? That's that's what our preference is. So that's our rule. Hopefully that answers that question. So, all right. Uh, so it looks like questions may have slowed down. I think this is probably a good place to stop. Uh, the first thing I want to do uh, is thank my uh, wonderful support behind the scenes, Miss Mary Hiller, who's on our communications team. Uh, we could not have got this executed without her. Uh, playing the moderator role, making sure we saw the questions that were coming in as they did. 
Uh, I want to give a huge thanks to uh, Michelle Gunter, who has been a wonderful resource in this conversation. Uh, you should absolutely be considering UNC as a law school if you are thinking about law school at all. Uh, it's been a pleasure having her join me this evening. Uh, hopefully we get a chance to do this again uh, before it's all said and done. Um, and, you know, I want to thank you all for making the time to be here this evening. Uh, it's really important that you take opportunities to hear from people like us about the law school process uh, because, you know, we manage it, right? We're deeply involved and deeply committed to it. Uh, I would encourage you to stay in contact with us. If you have any questions, contact our offices. We're pretty easy to find. Uh, and if there's anything that you all need, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, but we're going to call this one a wrap. If you are uh, registered for this, you'll see you'll receive a link to uh, view the recorded version of it. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, and please do stay in touch and have a great evening. Thanks, guys. Thank you.